Okay, so um, thank you all for being uh, prompt on that break. I know it's not easy. Um, so I would like to now, so you all met David Dower in our opening exercises, but I'd like to you know, reintroduce him at this moment. Um, David's a co-founder of HowlRound um, and also the artistic director of Arts Emerson, which is a peer program of HowlRound here in the Office of the Arts, um, which he can tell you more about at the end of today. In fact, if you would like a tour of this building, which has another beautiful theater that we aren't seeing right now, he, um, and also has a really cool history, um, he can uh, show anyone who's interested in that around at the end of today. Um, so David is a really practiced moderator at this dialogue format that we're gonna engage in, that we call Inner Circle, Outer Circle, uh, beginning this afternoon um, into tomorrow morning. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to him to give a brief uh, contextualization for why we like to use this format. It's something that we've used um, since, God, well, since like 2010, um, when we first uh, started doing convenings like this. And he can speak a little bit to, uh, you know, what we like about it and what we hope that it will help us surface over the next day together. David, take it away. Okay, great. Um, so for those of you who have not done uh, this uh, before, this is a technique that we use at HowlRound that uh, many of you have seen things like it. There's a fishbowl uh, concept and there's the long table concept. Uh, this is something slightly different uh, and it was developed uh, I'm basically borrowing it without permission from a meeting that I was part of for years and, and borrowed it many years ago. Um, and uh, it was created by David Bohm, working with uh, Native elders for a conversation in the Southwest where they were working to try to map what they were calling the language of spirit. They were trying to map a language bridge between indigenous ways of knowing and Western science. And David Bohm believed that dialogue is actually almost like a substance in quantum physics terms, it's, it exists. And it's actually making an effort to get into the room. And we are the people who bring the dialogue into the room. And uh, the way they ha have worked for many years, and it's incredibly powerful, uh, I hopefully we'll experience that in these couple of days, they work with this inner circle and outer circle concept. And on the inner circle, our job is simply to contemplate the question, listen to what's coming to you as in, in response to it, and if something does come, share it. If it doesn't come, wait. Listen to yourself, listen to the, your colleagues, and just speak here to each other. On the outer circle, this is called the listening circle, on the outer circle, the job is to actively listen to this conversation and to yourself at the same time. What are the things that you're hearing that you feel you want to share when we, when we break open the circle? What are the things that didn't come in at all that you feel we're missing um, and need to come in? Often it'll be the person who has the least to say who's sitting on the thing that's most needed to hear. And so I'll pull on people. Uh, but for this to, to work, it's a very active listening on the circle, on the outer circle, and this stays very focused on the inner circle. So we'll try not to perform so the listening circle, we'll try to stay with ourselves. Uh, and on the listening circle, you'll try to stay present to what's happening here. And then eventually we'll break it out. We'll all be on the circle again together. And then we'll start to unpack all of the things that have come up um, and that have been uh, trying to get in to the room, okay? So we're gonna work here for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. And Jamie's got cards to let me know when we've gone um, to the end of our time together, and then um, we'll all take our seats on the outer circle and we'll become a group of the whole again. Okay, it's clear? So let's, let's give it a whirl. This particular circle, the, this uh, conversation has been very smartly structured and I wanna congratulate all the people who put it together. Um, we're starting with uh, questions around the reality. We're kind of taking a, uh, an inventory of what's happening, what's working, what uh, problems there are, what trends there might be uh, in this work already. And it can be things that you've experienced through your own practice or things that you're observing in, around the field. We're really talking about art, theater in particular, and uh, climate change. Uh, and so, what do you, who would like to begin? We heard a lot already today, and maybe something's already percolating from what's been said uh, so far today. Anybody have an initial response to this prompt of where are we, what's working, what trends? You, 
can go well, over it. I'll, I'll go because in, to some degree I'm an observer, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Theater Without Borders is a, is a um, uh, as Chantal and Elizabeth mentioned, convened something, a gathering of people that became Climate Lens. Uh, Yuna and Lani know about it. So, um, and it calls itself a network of theater makers and culture workers at, um, uh, at the at intersection of art and, and uh, climate. And we created a web page, and on it is a link of the organizations of people who were participating. I look at that link, that list of links, and I start looking at all the information that has come in over the transom. I spend a lot of time on the internet, and I see this pool of activity, and this pool of activity, and this pool of activity. I see some of it coalesced in small groups in the United States. Um, I see other groups coalesced in Europe, a lot of activity in Europe. I see in my travels there's a few people that I talk to in Ethiopia. So it seems like there are these pools. And uh, they're like these all different listings of these organizations. And they seem, um, there is a burgeoning practice, a growing practice, mm. a burgeoning field, a growing field, but um, not um, particularly, as someone said, um, uh, visible and, and networked with one another. So I, I wonder about that, that, there's, that, the, that the reality is that there is a burgeoning field of practice at that intersection. It is happening around the world in eddies and pools, but it's, it's not connected globally. It's not collect, connected even locally sometimes. And that, um, that's impact, that has, that's influencing a lack of impact that the very practitioners who are doing it are so adamantly expressing and longing to achieve. So that's an observation. Yeah, that's a, a beautiful observation. So uh, anybody have a response to this initially to um, the notion of it burgeoning? Does that, does that feel tr true to your experience as well, that there's something that's growing? That would, that would say that there's something that, that's growing, that's spreading, that's emerging. Does that feel true in your own uh, communities? I'm agreeing. Thank you. Uh -huh. And so in what ways do you see it burgeoning, Georgiana? I think it's just become more, I, I, I literally just hear it more in conversation with um, playwrights. I think in, in my practice, I, I inherently write about climate change without knowing that that's what I'm doing, just because of I write about the human spirit as you know, or the human evolution, and constantly in looking for that evolution, it's obviously ta tackling all these other things. And so, it was recently, I think, that 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 I noticed the lens sort of zooming in, and people saying, "Oh, you know, you're writing," and not about even my work, even though I consider it an active um, practice. But I hear more of like, "Oh, I'm writing my climate change piece." Oh, I'm writing my mm -hmm. climate change play, or I'm writing my eco drama. The same way a playwright would say, you know, I'm writing a theater for young audiences. Like, like it's a genre. It's, right. it's genre. -ed. And um, I never saw it that way because I thought, how can we actually make a difference if we're, again, separating our. It's like the thing with the Latino theater, too, uh, that happens. You know, it's like I'm making Latino theater. And I actually entered a circle like this five years ago for the Latino Commons talking about the future of Latino theater. And uh, well, the first thing I said was, are we even thinking about, do we, are we going to have a plan in 2046 to inherit? You know, like it was, I was already thinking about that. And so I think it's, that's how I see it surface is that it's still this device in trying to define it or identify it, it's still separating it. Um, mm -hmm. And I just hear it m more and more from, from playwrights, from companies, from people seeking plays. Uh, we're looking for the eco play. We want our climate change play. We yeah. want our eco play. Alyssa, you have a uh, response there. I agree, and I feel like there's less trepidation around use of the language and the terminology in marketing, 
uh, for theaters. I think if you go on New Play Exchange, you can put in various environmentally related search terms and find plays, and it's not um, <coughs> equated with apocalypse necessarily, or or kind of written off as one tone. You know, there's uh -huh. more interest on the parts I think of theaters and um, New Play initiatives to explore what the stories might be. Um, I come from the perspective of, of an educator. And I think my students are um, scared, but for different reasons now. Um, it used to be um, they were fearful because they feel like they didn't know anything. And now with the ubiquity of knowledge that they, at least the internet affords, they feel like day two of eco-performance, they realize how complicit they are. And that feels um, crippling um, because they don't know where to start. Um, so a couple of things that I wrote down thinking about this question is I'm wondering how we can bring um, analogies, because I think they're very helpful for students. How can we bring them full circle in theatrical narratives or performance contexts? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I've read some wonderful articles on analogizing um, climate change and World War II, or there was a recent one, I think, in the HowlRound curated series on um, slavery and mm -hmm. climate change. and. Um, I'm thinking those are very useful for, um, we're all students of this, right? It's very useful for people to begin to understand the unimaginable, but how do you bring that full circle and not just um, kind of feel content with understanding it a little bit more? You know, how, how do we actually um, engage interest in the stories for uh, uh, the moment's sake and for the future's sake? Mm -hmm. Not for the, oh, we're beginning to understand it and therefore get a little bit more comfortable with its mm -hmm. sake, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question to you, Robert. Go ahead, take, take that. Um, and be go ahead, Hannah. Uh, I also have a question to think about, which is what is the particular role or power of theater? We're talking about this theater as um, a sort of focal point for our work in relation to the climate change. And you're talking about the new play exchange and talking about the play of the month or the flavor of the year, kind of. Uh, and so just even also to be thinking about what's working about theater in this, uh, in the face of this um, change. Robert, you have a uh, thought? Yeah, I think in, in answer to that question and to Alyssa's points about burgeoning new play initiatives, I think I can speak to one specific initiative at ART that um, is teaching us a lot about how to go about thinking about making work in this regard. Um, a couple of years ago, the Dan Schrag, who's a historical geologist who runs Harvard's Center for the Environment, actually came to our artistic office and asked if we might consider creating a joint commission program between the ART and Harvard Center for the Environment. Um, and that desire on his end was coming out of a, a, a real frustration that his colleagues and he were publishing all this kind of <coughs> evidence of crisis, but for whatever reason, that scientific discourse was not breaking through into a cultural sphere. So they came to us and, and we, over the past couple of years, have been working on a way to kind of cross-pollinate. So a power of theater in that regard that we're enjoying is thinking of theater not necessarily as a discursive or didactic medium, but one in which we can bring together people from different disciplines at every stage of the creative process. So some of the things that playwrights working on this commission program are able to do that we wouldn't be able to offer without this program where they're able to go out into deep ocean observatories um, off the coast of Cape Cod or spend a week living in the Arnold Arboretum in Jamaica Plain. Um, so bringing scientists on as creative collaborators rather than just subjects or people whose research we regard as primary sources um, mm -hmm. has been a really interesting source of burgeoning and abundance for us. Mm -hmm. Annie Hoover. Yeah, and um, I love that. And thank you for sharing that. I think that, um, uh, yeah, when you say that, it, it's really exciting to me because I feel like um, with the work that we do in Superhero Clubhouse, we talk a lot about how um, the act of making theater is um, a model for how uh, society could be, can be. And, um, and therefore, I think one of the, the core values we've always had is, yes, interdisciplinary collaboration, but also thinking beyond that, um, how are you making this piece? What, 
what is the process by which you're going about doing it? Whose voice is involved? Um, what is the future you want to propose here? Um, I think those are all questions that we hold near and dear and have tried for a long time to develop a set of uh, tools to uh, guide and express and try. And I was saying to someone earlier, we were chatting how exciting it is to me nowadays to try to um, empower more people to be part of the creative process, to people who are not artists, who don't identify as artists, people who don't identify even as scientists or anything just to like, because I think that the process of making a piece of theater together for a group of people is such an important thing and it teaches you so much and it, and it, um, and it ignites so much, there's so much possibility in it um, in terms of world building. And uh, yeah, so I love what you, what you shared. I, I wanna uh, ask about outside the US. Um, uh, what uh, trends, or, or how does it even sound to I mean, the two of you in particular, listening to the idea of centrality of theater as, as a tool, or in, this, in our work in this circle, we're using theater as a tool. How does it sound, or how does it play out in, outside the US in other contexts? Um, I, I can give you one, this, this uh, one example. We have a, a festival and conference of crossing boundaries in uh, yeah. Or could okay. you speak a little louder now? Okay. Uh, we have a Crossing Boundaries Festival and a conference uh, in, uh, which is organized in uh, uh, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. And uh, uh, the first was uh, in 2015 and we, we started organizing the second, uh, the second uh, edition of uh, Crossing Boundaries Festival. Uh, <coughs> This year, at the beginning of it, this year, but it didn't happen. Uh, it was uh, the theme was on uh, performance, uh, climate change, and human condition. It didn't happen because of uh, there was a state of emergency in uh, uh, Ethiopia and a lack of funding, and also uh, very few number of applications. Mm. because the, the climate change is not familiar, especially in Ethiopia and uh, in some parts of Africa. We, we are the people who are the most affected by uh, you know, climate change. For example, in Ethiopia, drought, uh, deforestation is very common. And we know we, this uh, you know, climate change is affecting us, but theater is not you know, acting towards you know, creating awareness in, I've been in, you know, I've been um, in theater profession for the last um, 10 years or, or more, but uh, I have never seen any play written on, uh, uh, written or produced on uh, climate change. Uh, so I was wondering why, I always ask myself, why is, why is theater reluctant mm -hmm. to, you know, to engage itself to the most important question of uh, our time. So this is, this is the reality that we, are, we have now in Africa. Uh, in crossing boundaries, we have only, you know, uh, in, the, in the previous uh, festival, we have uh, 11 countries participating in the, uh, in the festival. Uh, there were different issues, but this time we have applicants from um, five countries uh, so from South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Burundi, but mm, uh, none from Ethiopia, mm -hmm. which is organizing country. And we were asking people, uh, you know, we made it public. We made the call public and we, uh, we contacted the theater professionals to take part in the uh, festival, but the <laughs> most people think, especially in Ethiopia, uh, climate change is a Western issue or it's a luxury. Mm. Uh, that, <laughs> you know, uh, and most of our plays, I think, uh, uh, Roberta is familiar. Uh, most of our our plays in the theater productions are on uh, uh, human relationships and family love and. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of them are romantic comedies, and we don't, you know, <laughs> we don't 
uh, write in the engage our audiences in the most important question of uh, our time. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are uh, the challenge really if we speak about this internationally is that we call different things theater. Go for it. Say more. And uh, whereas, you know, if you're talking about industry, they call the same thing industry everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea of theater about climate change um, is kind of uh, alien uh, mm -hmm. because, not, not because of any other reason, except that it's the framing that is a bit alien, I think, to what theater in India means. And for instance, you know, like a, a good example would be there is a Ramayana which is performed over a month, uh, which is this a, an epic, but it's a modern thing. It's not it's not like some kind of religious thing. It's a modern thing. It's like Muslims play Hindu gods, and you know, like it's all of that. And for that one month, the people who are performing that they are treated as gods, uh, but you know, they're smoking and they're coming back and they're performing. Uh, <laughs> But this performance travels across one of them. There are many such performances. One of the performances of this epic, it travels across six villages in East India. Uh, and it maps essentially harvest. It, it is like site specific for 1,000 years. When they cross the ocean in the epic, they cross the river and the entire village all the villages move. So essentially, if I go to your village, I'll stay in your house, and then we'll go to her village, and we'll stay. It's like that. So within that narrative, there is environment, there is mythology, there is war. It's together. Mm -hmm. I think part of the challenge today is that institutions that want to fund climate change work want artists to make stuff in silos, Mm -hmm. uh, which is just very counterintuitive to what people work in. Uh, and, and of course, it's language, you know, like you, the application, everything is in English, whereas all these performances are not in English. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there, is a, there is a rush to ask people to make work on climate change because it's urgent, but there's no urgency to go and watch what exists. I think, yeah, that's what I have to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here. Thank you. Um, oh gosh. Uh, okay. So I I think that there's uh, also some value maybe in thinking about um, widening. Uh, wh when you say uh, the this group that I've been a part of that's met a couple of times now, New York City of of New York City artists. Um, and actually, not just New York City artists of various kinds of performance artists. Um, we called ourselves Climate Lens because um, we wanted to propose this idea that um, because climate is now our reality, that we should be making work or we should think about making work through the lens of climate rather than um, about it. Mm. Because that is um, perhaps something that's more inclusive. You, uh, what is a love story through the climate lens? Um, what is a family drama through the climate lens? What is a movie? Uh, what, have, what, have, what have you? Um, if you talk to Yuna later, she'll have some great examples for you of what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Mm, through it rather than about it. Go ahead. Yeah, oh, yeah I wanted to, to echo both of those things in, in a way that I think the... Um, uh, the, the key for me, or, or where I see the change happening to really towards theater for climate change is the everyday thing, is to um, the remythologization, <laughs> what's the word? Like remythicize um, the, the consciousness, you know? And so like read, so take the things that are already existing and listen to them and see how pilgrimage theater is working and what what it what it does and and what it you know if we absorb what is around us and we respect it then we love it and know that you know those things instead of like sort of trying to reinvent the wheel which I notice that is a lot of what's happening I mean I write sci-fi as well and a lot of that happens to be about 
proposing ideal versions of a future. So, uh, but I think there's a, a, a link missing, or perhaps that's what I feel of the bringing back the myths and, and, and re-enchanting sort of that consciousness, uh, you know, and um, using animals, you know, uh, of course, as Yuna has said, uh, immigrants identify with the tales of animals. And so using these things that, that we, that are our entry points to tell our stories, but with the lens of climate change. Mm -hmm. Alison, you have a... Yeah, I mean, here, here to what everybody says. And I think one of the things we have to make the lens so wide, and I do think when you first asked the question about what's burgeoning, I think one of the most exciting things for me is to look at the way, um, not finally, but finally more, the, uh, the activities and the challenges of social justice and environmental justice are the same thing, and so much of it comes from the cultural structures created by white supremacy and the requirement of othering that has become so central. I can only speak to white America, because um, that's, that's what I am a part of. Um, and if you look at the history of the environmental movement, it was a deeply racist, deeply white supremacist thing. So I, I, I think in the spirit of what a lot of people have been saying, we need to create lots of work about climate change. We also need to widen the lens um, in our love stories. And we also need to look at everything that already exists and say everything that ever existed has been within a climate. And it's all sitting there in the language of whatever playwright. And a lot of it is just pulling, pulling it out so that reminding people that whatever othering we have fallen for never was true and it doesn't ever have to be true. And a lot of that is, there's a thing we do at OSF we call green turgy. Um, and Ritha Ramanan and I talk about it a lot is, we do Shakespeare plays, and there is, and we do a lot of other plays too, but in every play, every play takes place in a context, an environment, um, and I do think a lot of it is simply the getting used to the language. When we hear the phrase climate change in a play now, there are a lot of people who they just go on their own journey, mm -hmm. right, and they, they create this imagined whatever it is in their minds because climate change has become so political and so culturally othered in the same way phrases like white supremacy, people go on their own journeys. The more often we put these words in our mouths and in the mouths of our characters, the more comfortable our audiences will be to go along on the journey of us, of making these connections between all these things. So it's, it's, it's create the art and make the language about the art as all inclusive um, as possible. And I, so it, we don't, I'm very excited about creating a wide you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plays about climate change, the environment, but I'm also excited by the thousands and millions of plays that are produced everywhere that already exist and that we can tell whether it's the school children who are doing Alice in Wonderland, let's talk about this in terms of this wider okay. world that they were operating in. Um, mm -hmm. So we have, m we have much more power, I think, than we know we do. Good. Yeah, we'll go here and then here. Yeah, and I think something that is really exciting to think about battling as we, as we undertake those initiatives is acknowledging that the theater has historically often been an ideal instrument of exclusion, um, both socially and imaginatively. Like I think it's, it's interesting to be having this convening in a black box because I think <coughs> the theater has historically trained us en masse to exclude non-human life from our own imaginations. And I think thinking about going back to these texts and structures in search of those other voices um, is a really exciting idea. Alyssa, you had a thought and then... I found two strategies really helpful in the classroom, the college classroom with um, students doing workshops. And one is to actually start with a narrative they know. Uh, fairy tales are easiest for them, but it can be many other things. And it kind of points out to them um, what they don't know but desperately want to about climate because as they start to flesh out the you know three-dimensionality of the story or look at in the ways in which it's exclusionary and they need to adapt it for today's world or tomorrow's future, they are encouraged to inquire more deeply um, than adapting um, science um, articles and um, books. I work with the, um, uh, the Sixth Extinction, for example, 
and they do pieces and our warm up reminded me of it because I remember a couple of students working with the essay that's about bats and they had the entire audience watch it by turning around and um, folding forward and looking upside down at what was taking place on stage rather than trying to merely anthropomorphize the bats, right? It was trying to say, you know, how do you um, encourage a different way of looking and put that um, responsibility on the humans? Um, so those are just two anecdotes, but one layer I wanted to add that complements a lot of what's been brought up is um, how do we bring humor into all this? It's both a trend, but also something I think that can be a liability in that it seems to rub shoulders with um, hypocrisy and complicity. And I feel like that can be in a productive way. Um, is it appropriate is the name of the short piece from Climate Change Theater Action? I'm trying to remember. Chantal talked about it at the start of today. Um, what is it? Appreciation, thank you, thank you. I've forgotten. Um, but something where you kind of you know, steer into the skid of um, how ridiculously complicit we are in all of this. Um, and then what do, you, what do you do though with that uncomfortable laughter? Um, that's something I'm curious about. And I'm wondering if any of you have had experiences with either productive or prohibitive laughter. I guess I'll talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what are you sitting on, Jessica? Uh, I mean, just different things. And like, so I don't, although I agree about the notion of framing in terms of theater, that like, you know, you don't necessarily need a frame of theater. You know, I suppose um, I'm not in the theater scene. So, but, uh, you know, similarly, like when I was in the Marshall Islands, um, there was a women's meeting and uh, some women from a, a group, um, some elder women, they were uh, irradiated um, in the 1954 Bravo uh, test by the US. Um, and they just stood up and did a piece, um, uh, I guess we could frame it as a term of um, poetry, um, about climate change. Um, but they're also most familiar with the US military. And I think it's important to historicize uh, climate change and the rhetorics that we use and in thinking about the way that the military um, and multinational corporations have created certain languages of complicity, of vigilance, of neoliberal um, responsibilities. And so I think that like a number of the anxieties I was just kind of hearing around and different frames actually are really manufactured and I, I'm interested in historicizing those. And I think it goes back to what you were saying in terms of um, you know, colonial, neocolonial, white supremacist, uh, patriarchal, you know, gender violence, um, and uh, violence against indigenous and other persons and, and spaces. And so those are just the things that I was thinking about. Like how do we decolonize our rhetoric as part of this? Uh, this is a bit of a segue then, and it, and it um, bounces right off of that. Earlier, I was hearing a, a great deal, or some, and it's echoed again here, about the imbalance in terms of resources. Money, power, even the language um, has created a kind of um, barrier, um, an intentional barrier, it sounds like, uh, in, a, in this work. Uh, and. I wonder if we could spend a minute thinking about where our richness is. So if these are deficits, like we don't have the money and we don't have the political power and in some ways the language is locking us into frames that we reject, what are our, rich, what are our riches? Um, where are we strong? You mentioned um, a lot of local, hyper-local activity. Um, and in many ways, climate is experienced locally. Um, is more viscerally than globally. Uh, what, what might be some riches that you could say, well, this is what makes me hopeful, or this is where we might turn, yeah. I'm just gonna try to, as you were speaking, I was thinking of a performance, um, you know, uh, which I had seen in a Buddhist monastery, a, a Tibetan performance, and I was thinking that it was so provocative because this work actually doesn't need a lot of money. Right. Um, a certain kind of performance. Uh, because when we are talking about a dramaturgy which is connected to the environment, it doesn't necessarily need a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the strength of some of the best work that I've seen, at least in my little experience. Uh, the other thing is that when 
this the dramaturgy is pitched the in the way uh, environment is env environment is already historical and mythological it's already present in a history hence it doesn't necessarily need to be introduced as a new character if you see, if you see what i mean so it's it, it's in a way um, if the drama the overall dramaturgy of space of time of light and the story is in union then the work becomes automatically very powerful uh, without again it needing uh, very many twists and turns so i think the dramaturgy and the thing about material uh, are both in favor of this work mm -hmm. uh, when done in a certain way. Great. Anyone else have a sense of, or a response even to that? Yeah, Roberta. Um, I, I have, uh, I, I know you asked us to think of where the abundance lies, and, and I struggle sometimes. Yeah, yeah go ahead, say more. <laughs> because, say more. <laughs> um, I, I, we are, and, and uh, Yuna uh, actually articulated this in a way that, that uh, has stuck with me um, at uh, a gathering. Um, we are beings th uh, uh, in our environment. That's, that's, it's happening now. It's not a gonna or has. <coughs> um, uh, so um, this is true, and, and the acknowledgement of that and using as Lanny was saying, a different lens could open pathways to giving um, uh, others this sense we have that we're integrated um, with the environment. I'm not saying this very well, but what I, what I struggle with is this notion of the local experience and the one-on-one -on -one introduction in relationship to, and we were talking about this, tiers of impact mm -hmm. and and this is where can you talk about those tiers for a second because we had that uh -huh. conversation outside of this room we did yeah, bring it in and um so uh what what i struggle with is i see burgeoning work i see a range of work from spongebob's the musical you know the the ecological <laughs> the the broadway um you know climate change play uh, to um, performance art and <coughs> visual arts and songs. And so I see a huge spectrum of work being done locally and, and, uh, and globally uh, and an a desire to connect, uh, to see that work and to support that work, the work of artists. But it's the infrastructure and the um, concentric circles that I struggle with, like how then if we were going to model, it, it, how then does that impact the institutions within which artists are working, the, um, the, um, the communities within which um, work is being presented, and then the, the policies and the policy makers and these, these larger global meta phenomenon and I'm struggle what I struggle with in the reality and describing the reality is um, yeah yes and a, a strength is that the field is burgeoning that the enthusiasm is growing that that things are becoming more normal that it can be um, present in the world and and uh, and seen and not uh, and, and 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 received but to me, I'm worried that it's that that what we're struggling with is wanting to have an impact that's greater at these other tiers. Yeah. So I, I have a question, and Allison, did you have a comment, or did the mic just end up in your hand? Um, yeah, just uh, real quick. I do. Th following up on you were saying in terms of what we have, we do have the power to model collective will, right? And that's so incredibly important. And I don't think that theater necessarily puts that out into the world, that that's what we do. Um, and the more we can do that, the better. But I do think we can also look at, at changing our internal practice. Um, there is, I mean, I'm speaking from the regional theater model. There is nothing less democratic in the world than a regional theater rehearsal room, right? <laughs> I mean, that shit's crazy. And so I think we need to use what our belief in collective will 
also to go up against the gatekeepers of these large cultural institutions. The amount of resources that is controlled by large cultural, cultural institutions in this, in this country specifically is enormous. And the power they have over determining the fate of arts in our country is wrong, um, as well-minded as so many people are in doing this work. And it's like we need to, I'm, I'm saying this, uh, working f at one of the biggest theaters in the country, we need to like have sit-ins in our artistic director's offices and say, no, I'm not going home until you do this play or you undertake this program. And I know the realities that we all face in terms of all arts organizations are incredibly finance strapped. But really, what does it all matter? Like, you know, if we can't, if we can't agree on one thing, like we shouldn't destroy the earth and every th living thing or those living things that can't survive these changing conditions. I do think we have to draw a line in the sand and we have to put our bodies in the way and we have to put our jobs in the way and that's easier for me to say. Um, and I'm not asking everybody to do that, but I do think there are people who can actually embody the collective will within institutions. I think, uh, Karen, this is really burning. I, what's exciting to me in general, and maybe that's what's the strength, right, is that there's something exciting about it, is not so much that let's get in those artistic directors' rooms and get, because I hear that from other pockets of what's happening in the theater when it comes to representation, right? We're not going to do this until you put women on stage. We're not going to do this until you put Latinos. And, and, and that's fine and well, and that's part of what it is. But what's exciting to me, and I think our strengths really lie if we're caring about this, is to do the rebellious act and the, re the truly rebellious act, you know, to, to be site-specific, to put it in the places, to do pilgrimage theater, to, do, to take people through the journeys that, so that it's not dependent on these things. Of course, it's easier said than done, and it's idealistic, and I don't know the solution, that's why I'm here. But you know, but the the hoping, the thinking about it, the believing in it, that truly, the true believing in it is is the same thing that makes me believe that obviously the planet is fine without us, and that you know if it wipes us out, it's still gonna you know. So there's this there's this regenerative regenerative uh, model that that nature is giving us uh, that we can apply to the arts that w we're not mimicking nature in how we're creating the arts, we're mimicking our social structures. And that's what I think is, is very different about trying to make theater for climate change. It's like, let's, let's look at the, you know, what's already in nature and mimic that and see, see what happens. I mean, it could fail, but. Mm -hmm. on, oh. on the note of mimicry, I think uh, <coughs> one of theater's greatest strengths in my mind is the ways in which as a process it, models what we need to be doing more broadly. So like systems thinking, for example, is something I have to introduce to my students. And um, there are so many people, subscribers often included, who come to the play and they think like, that's it, you know? And as a dramaturg, I talk a lot with, with playwrights and students about how, yeah, the, the audience's experience, the first impression is the thing. But more and more, I'm starting to try to think beyond that and uh, models like the Eco Side Case book and you know, other things that have been published around um, workshop-based uh, performance and concerned with climate change, it makes me think about transparency about the process, that that is something that theater um, has as a strength. And then this is really simplistic, but the fact that we repeat what we do. You know, if you write a play, you're more often than not very hopeful that it will get repeated again and again. So when you put on a Shakespeare play, when you make a change from the, you know, so-called traditional framework, people will sit up and notice. Um, and is there something innovative we can do around the fact that a, a play gets repeated or um, could you move, an, you know, an art um, a visual based installation from place to place and how does that change it? And um, all these different things we can do with materiality. Yeah. In the US, I just want to call into the room a project called Cry You One, which I think some of you have seen or you know about, and we may talk about at some point in this, but it's a New Orleans-based uh, project around uh, a Cry You One, an ensemble created piece that was about the loss of coastal land. Uh, Jessica, you had a, a response. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, like, in speaking about, um, you know, making things sensible, to people, um, and again, you know, not having the kind of theater background, but like when I, I, I remember, you know, uh, speaking in front of the Department of Defense um, about nuclear issues, and uh, people were just talking about nuclear issues, nuclear issues, right? And um, I brought up, uh, you know, some of the connections and the narratives between 
um, the issues in the Marshall Islands uh, and you know what we had been talking about in terms of bridging nuclear weapons testing and climate change. And I was actually just talking to the executive, executive director of the Marshall's Educational Initiative and she was like, yeah, if you remember, you know, a lot of the people from DOD were just like, we had no idea that these connections were even made. So I think even like, it's not simple to get in the door in there and it's not simple to have those kind of conversations, but like, you know, if you, I think too, like we, sh we need to have keywords in a language, but I also think presenting something in a way where like DOD people will just kind of listen. And now that, you know, they, they recently put a report about climate change and nuclear weapons testing, right? Linking these things. So it was like, however many years ago that was, people weren't really thinking, I'm not saying it was like me that did it, but I think it was like those <laughs> reiterated <laughs> conversations, you know what I mean? With like people who don't, yeah, just kind of breaking down those boundaries too. And that, to me, what I'm hearing is like, that is also a kind of theatrical endeavor. Um, and that's just what I wanted to say. And, and yeah, we're gonna um, open the circle out here in just one second, but uh, uh, what I'm, what I, uh, I'm hearing underneath this is uh, are a couple of changes, and I just want to see if you would agree with me. Uh, in one um, area, I, I hear the that theater practice is actually um, it can be and maybe is evolving in certain ways, both private individual practice, but also the habits of institutions are being uh, can be evolved in the U.S. And perhaps um, the, there's some kind of evolution that can take place in. Um, other contexts, I'm most familiar with the U.S. one, but I'm, keep bringing your own context to the fore um, if you're not in the U.S. context. Um, so that there's the possibility of changing both individual practice and then institutional practice. Uh, and then there's also this change of who the audience is. Um, you're talking about uh, the, the audience, the, the people who are participating are different than what the in regional theater audience perceives it, <laughs> is perceived to be. Um, and, and the DOD audience is a different audience, and perhaps there's something to do about a head tilt around, well, if we're making theater for whom, not just toward what end, um, and the for whom question, and then, then leads to things like pilgrimage, or it leads to, to other, you know, even what OSF has done in terms of its audience. Um, so uh, are these uh, areas of, of uh, potential or, or progress or, motion at any rate that, that you're seeing, both practice and then for whom in terms of theater? Is that, am I hearing that properly? Or does that not sound like anything you're related to? <laughs> I'm gonna stop talking, but um, uh, I was on a panel for NIFA, um, unsurprisingly, and I mean, just because power, you know, even great organizations, we all depend on each other to make decisions about how we fund and, what artists we value. Um, and uh, the, the, t the conversation around community involvement and community involvement, not just in terms of participating in the art um, in a moment, but actively participating in the devising of work is completely different from the conversation that was happening 20 years ago mm -hmm. among organizations that are funded by folks like NIFA, and NIFA, I think, is an extraordinary organization and is actually out front of the that's field. That's the New England Foundation New England for, the Foundation arts, for the Arts, for people who don't know um, exactly. And so that's awesome. Uh, we're gonna break uh, this uh, circle open now. Uh, so if you wanna just take your seats, we can leave the chairs here, um, and I'll, I'll continue to facilitate uh, just so that there's somebody and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, if you're uh, moved to chime in, just raise your hand and I'll uh, keep a note of people in the order that I see them. But sometimes we, um, the conversation will be more uh, eruptive than that. And you saw it happen even in this circle. And I wanna make uh, a, a welcome and uh, a kind of acknowledgement of the people who are watching on what is the third circle. So if there's anyone who's watching the live stream live, uh, the Twitter hashtag is, sorry, I can't read it, I don't have my, Theater and climate change. Theater is an RE, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, theater and climate change. Uh, so feel free to tweet your questions in and someone will be monitoring the hashtag as well, uh, or your comments. Uh, so you're hearing uh, the beginning of our discussion. Who's sitting with, a, with a, a comment, a response, a question, a challenge to what we've heard so far? So we're gonna use the microphone so that the people in the third circle can hear us. Uh, so we'll go, here, uh, now I'm still getting names, so I'm gonna have to point some. Here, MJ, I saw your hand, uh, and then Peterson. 
Uh, yeah, could you say your name when you talk just so the people know who you are? Whoops. You didn't want the microphone? No, but M MJ. You said MJ first. Oh, no, I, I was oh. saying I didn't know her name, so I was pointing. <laughs> Thank you. Teddy. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you to everyone. My name is Teddy. Hi. Um, that was so cool. I just want to acknowledge that was really beautiful. Thank you all for being so candid. Um, I What really struck me prior to this and then during that conversation was the idea of reality. And I was also just wanted to welcome in the reality of where we do our, our work um, and the reality of that I'm cold right now, and I imagine many others are physically cold. And so just to bring in that we make a lot of this work in spaces, I come from a regional theater background, um, that are old, that are out of date, that are underfunded, that are energy inefficient, um, and that lack some of the ability to fundraise, whether to improve that or the priority of maintaining the work on stage to address really that we empathetically can speak to a lot of the other um, fields that are coming to the climate change conversation saying, yes, but this is the way it's always been done and I don't have the ability or the funding or the time to radically rethink the way um, we make our work and the way we actually impact the environment. So that was just one thing I wanted to bring in the idea that that we have hot lights in a cold space full of people um, that, in my experience, have often been old and out of date. So um, not to throw a problem out without a couple of solutions. Um, I suppose the first is how do we stand behind those organizations, um, not abandon them saying you're energy inefficient and therefore worse than the rest of us. Um, how do we invite audiences to welcome and make space for work that is presented outside of those institutions and we can address this is using sunlight, using the field, using the space that we have and doesn't necessarily impact the environment in the same way that these large auditoriums may. And then I guess th my other idea is how do we as, an organ as a community really acknowledge that publicly and welcome a way in order to take a first step that other fields may be able to follow, acknowledging and humbly that we may not have all of the tools to solve all of the problems, um, but that we're engaging in the conversation and welcoming others to sort of help us. Okay. Um, yes. Good, great, thank you. Uh, MJ? Thank you for that, Teddy. Because um, the, the framework that you lay out highlights the ways in which theater institutions are like steering a cruise ship and they can be really slow moving and, and, and clunky. And then I, I also think about, ab about theater as opposed to other genres as being actually very nimble. Um, I learned, so I, I wrote a sitcom pilot set in Antarctica that I like uh, hoped would be the next Parks and Recreation. And while I was working on that, I learned that ABC and NBC both purchased pilots set in Antarctica, um, one from the creators of New Girl, one from the creators of Bob's Burgers, and both of them never ended up going into production. And it makes me want to bang my head against the wall that that those stories didn't get to be told on, on, a, on those enormous platforms that network television represent, but theater, on the other hand, does have the luxury of a quicker turnaround and and there's we can fill this room several times over with with professionals who have been able to successfully create content about climate change and i'm so sorry i forget your name Alyssa. yes M melissa Alyssa. Alyssa. um Alyssa, i was so appreciative that you brought up the role of humor um and i and i link that back to the spectrum that we that we uh set forth to create about hope and despair and and the role that humor can play there and and i i want to interrogate that further that's something that i'm really interested in uh, because i also think that humor is is a tool for disarming and, and inviting audience members to come in and to be glad that they're in the room um, and with such a heady difficult topic i think that humor can be a really important tool while also honoring what 
what you said about about complicity and hypocrisy, um, and I think I think there's work to be done in operating with with those uh, with those truths and moving forward with them. Okay, uh, Peterson. Then we'll go to Yuna and uh, Lydia. Can I pull you next? I, I can feel you have things. <laughs> I echo what you said about humor. In fact, I think it's essential to bring into this conversation because of how it physically changes our audience's bodies <laughs> and their brains. I mean, it literally does. But what I wanted to ask was a question about the overarching question, what's working? And I'm wondering, how do we define working? And who defines working? And how do we assess it? When we, when we ask this very important question, are, are there some collective aims and goals that we have that we're looking for that we can assess this work to see if it is working and what that means for us? Mm -hmm. So Yuna, then Lydia. Kay. Cicada, how are you doing? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna come to you just because I wanna get other uh, perspectives from outside the US as well. Um, thank you. Um, I, I just thought that that uh, first conversation in the inner circle was incredibly rich and uh, I resonated to so much of it. And I guess I kind of wanted to uh, say something about what I was hearing. And, um, and I want to take off from uh, Roberta's discussion where she talked about uh, being, being aware of these pools and pockets of burgeoning activity, but then also being... Um, um, being concerned uh, and sort of held up around questions of infrastructure, the, the context and systems within which we sit and which we do our work. And I wondered if, if that, you know, you talk about a kind of disconnect there, and to me that disconnect also mapped onto some of the other things that were said. One was these two accounts of, or two understandings of theater. Uh, one of theater, uh, you know, as Lani was saying, uh, and Alison, theater as um, uh, a, a place of collaboration, consensus, uh, a model for community, for creativity. And then uh, what Robert said, which is the history of theater as a apparatus for exclusions of various kinds. And I'm, I'm thinking that's, that's one of the, that disconnect between two visions of theater, but also between certain kinds of activity and then the larger underlying systems uh, that are there. Um, and, uh, and I guess a third conversation mapped onto for me was um, uh, I think what, what you said, and I, I don't know your name yet, yeah, about um, you know, why don't we use the models that are given to us by the non-human, by, by the more than human world, by nature, um, to do our work rather than rely on the ones that have been um, uh, bequeaths to us by mm -hmm. the socio-economic systems within which we operate. To me, that's again another version of the same disconnect. Uh, you know, one way of doing work versus another system that's forcing us to not do work in that way. And so, to me, what all this means, what this disconnect is really about, and I'm going to use a word that's not um, a popular word in America or it was a popular word back in the 60s. And that's the word ideology. Uh, we, when we talk about the climate lens, what we're really talking about is the need for a new ideology. Um, and um, a mobilization around a, a, a different set of values and hierarchies, um, or non-hierarchies, I should say. Uh, we, we talked about making the lens wider. You know, and you got uh, Naomi Klein's fabulous book, which the title, This Changes Everything. That's a real um, you know, truthful statement about how we need to understand climate. We have to understand it everywhere and everywhere. Um, but ideology uh, in includes, and this is uh, related to what you were saying about decolonizing. Uh, it's not just decolonizing the language systems, it's also decolonize, decolonize, decolonizing our minds. Um, and uh, so the way I've been trying to think about this is to chart a multi-species ideology, um, an anthropocenic ideology, 
um, a disanthropocentric ideology, that the, uh, just the way we've, in, in our history of progressive movements, we've had to fight against white supremacy, fight against the patriarchy. The thing to fight against now is anthropocentrism and human exceptionalism. Okay. And that's ideological. And, we, and that involves a paradigm shift, but then also certain amount of commitment to revolutionary activities. Okay, great. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, and then, uh, Elena, I see you taking notes. Would you mind coming in after, and Sikhati, would you mind coming in after Lydia? Okay, good, thank you. Lydia. Um, I can't say that I've formulated any specific thoughts just That's yet. That's okay. But, um, <laughs> I'm 100% with you, Una, that um, I think that the fundamental thing that has to happen is that we have to completely change our value system. And so that's why for me, um, the idea of embracing non-Western worldviews is so incredibly important. And the idea of dismantling the notion of empire is so important. Um, because without it, I don't know that we'll actually grasp the necessity of, of what we need to grasp, right? Because of what our values are, um, centered upon. So I also thank you, Allison, uh, right? Allison, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for talking about decolonizing, and um, on so many levels for everyone, right? Uh, it, it has to happen. Um, I, I, I also just think that one of the things that came up too is that there's different types of theater, different um, forms of theater, and just wanna make sure that we're all recognizing that in this room, um, that you know, your theater, your home institution is not someone else's home institution, is not the way someone else makes theater with five-year-olds, the way someone else makes theater on the corner in the backyard, whatever that is. Um, but that all of those different things have different aims and goals and serve different people um, who have different needs. Um, and so likewise, thinking about those kinds of models, what is the fundamental thing that we all can kind of wrap around, if that makes any sense, or get behind? Um, and so I agree, there's like this, this, what's that fundamental thing? Because all of us are working in so many different ways. Okay, great, thank you. And then uh, after uh, Elena, I'll go to Marta and then Ramona. Oh, uh, Twitter question, okay, great. Uh, so Cicada. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, um, it's very interesting when you, what's her name again? Yuna. Yuna, mm -hmm. and when you bring this team, uh, team about the ideology, because I think it's the most important to do, to discuss now. It's, I don't think it's an, from the old, say 60s or 70s, but for now, because I I'm come from Brazil, and uh, when I was preparing myself to come to this meeting, uh, my, my colleagues always asked to me, what, I, what, what are you going to do in the US America now? And with that, the, we have in Brazil a, a coup, a, a political coup, against the, 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 the structural govern, the democratically elect government, and it's a, a, a coup that was made by a group of people, the rich people and the middle class people who believe in this ideology that came from the US for, for the people there, and the idea that what is important, to, for instance, about oil, you know, about the about these oil companies, about all these things. And the people ask me, what are you are going to do there to disclose climate change? Why? No, because we have more urgent things here to discuss, they said to me. And I said, okay, we have, but we have also to discuss this. But of course, you need to decolonize our mind mentality. And our mentality is always that or we are pro or we are contra U.S. and this ideological uh, mentality that come from U.S., this North epistemological way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when I, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm staying 
and black, and, 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 I mean, thinking about, okay, we need to discuss climate change, but in Brazil now, we have problems with the poor people, the people that, that are the, 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 the most important victims from the, this new government that ideologically made a coup in Brazil. And these people is suffering now, and people have not, not condition to think about the climate change now, because they need to, th do, to think about the, the, the price of the gas. Mm -hmm. Ten days ago, we have a, 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 a strike, a big strike about gas, and gas is a problem in about the, the, the gasoline. Eh? It's a problem about the climate change, but for the people there, it was terrific because people has nothing to eat sometimes in, yeah. in some place where I live that is far away from the, the big city, the big center. We had very big uh, uh, problem with the, the um, uh, what's the name? Food and, and gas and uh, et cetera. Necessities. And this is, for me, what is the reality. What about what kind of reality we are talking about here? Yeah. I think we are talking the reality is very local in a, in a place, but in the other in the other side it, it is very ideological, and I think we need to think about this point, and we need to think about that all this discussion about climate change to me come from a North ideology. Mm -hmm. I have no lots of people. Discussing, I, 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 have, I have no example. Of course, I am mean, the, the only people from Latin America here, from South America here, and I hope it in three, four, one year we, we have more, because we need to 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 make a more strong discuss about that in in South America. But the point is, it is or not. Uh, North epistemological point of view. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, it, it, something that we also heard in the circle, um, and just to call out, that there is a kind of uh, just a, a privilege, or, or a, a kind of you talk about white supremacy, Allison. But there is a frame here that is really uh, specific and not necessarily global <laughs> in terms of even this circle. And so to keep calling those differences into the room, don't sit out simply because it doesn't include you, we want to make a space that actually includes. So break into it in that way. Uh, Elena. Uh, okay, so I was trying to gather my words. I feel like I'm really learning a lot here. Um, and then the few people that I've talked to so far, just really acknowledging and claiming my own artistic um, identity, I guess. And so some of the things that stuck out to me um, was this need to figure out how the framework can be indigenized, I guess, because I think we talk a lot about decolonizing, um, but for me in the work that I do, and also because I'm a mom, <laughs> and if you say don't do something, then they're gonna do it, right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> so <laughs> I think focusing on indigenizing rather than thinking of something that you don't want to focus on. And I think, for me, with some of the work that I do, and I think it happens in theater as well, but kind of the re-traumatizing um, methods that we use from the Western standpoint. So when we talk about the trauma-informed care and you know this, this, these ACEs scores and all these things that, it, so I'm, I'm explaining from a public health standpoint right now, that we kind of re-traumatize people by focusing on the negative and expressing our ideas of what will happen. Oh, so, you know, so I did an activity in one of my classes. Um, I have my master of public health, but I did an activity where we, they told us to make this imaginary line, asked us a series of questions, and if you had experienced any of those things, you take steps backwards. But if you have, or if you have not, then you, you walk forward. And almost every person in my class was, um, we call them washitu, but like the, the, the white descent, they would, they were way above the line. And I was, you know, myself and another native student, student in my class or indigenous student, 
we were behind the line. And I think that was the first time, which I feel like I've, I've worked through a lot of that stuff, you know, like the trauma that I've gone through in my life, but it re-traumatized me. And I remember crying. And so I, I didn't even know where it came from. So I think when we think about theater, instead of thinking of the, the negative parts of what the Western theater has taught, I think we need to take it into an indigenous standpoint. And the word that comes to me is a word that is with my people. And I've, and I've heard it a bunch of times in this room, but it's called uh, midakuye oyaski, which means we're all related. And it's not just, oh, sorry guys, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> That's okay. But it's not just um, us and other people that we're related to, but it's, it's like we, there's, we're related to the ground, we're related to the wind, we're related to the water, we're related to, and we understand, so like when we eat food, we put it out. Um, we put some food out for, you know, all of our relatives. And I remember my little girl, because I didn't understand it either, and my little girl was like, I went and checked it, Mom, Mom, and it was still there. <laughs> you know, the food is still there. And at the time, we were living in an apartment, and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, they must not have been hungry. You know, like, <laughs> because I didn't know how to explain it. Then she asked one of her grandmas, and they were like, so how it works, and this, this is, you know, teachings from an elder. She said that every single thing in this world has an aura or an entity or a spirit. And so when we place out food, we don't, we don't just place it out for the animals. You know, we place it out for the spirits. We place it out for the insects. We place it out. And so the spirits, when we say we're feeding our ancestors, they're, they're eating off of that aura and that spirit of the food that we're offering because our prayers were put into that. And if we're living in the country, then the animals will come eat it. You know, it's like, so everything is directly connected in that way. And I think when we think about theater, we really do need to look at an indigenous standpoint. And we also need to understand that we're all related and we need to quit. And, and we all have different experiences. We have different walks of life, different paths that we've gone through. And it was strategically meant for us to feel disconnected from each other. And so nobody's, one thing I've, <laughs> one thing I've learned really kind of the hard way is that Nobody's trauma is worse than anybody else's. Every single um, group of people have gone through some kind of trauma. And once we realize that we're all connected and stop trying to say who has worse pain or <laughs> who's worse off, then we can really build really good things together. And I think um, humor, oh my gosh, definitely humor. I think that for us, we believe that laughter is the best medicine. So anywhere that we can put it into the work that we do, it's so important. Um, and then the last comment is that I think, um, ah, I lost my place. But anyway, yep, so I we think, can come back. yeah, yeah, we'll, so, we'll so back. thank you for calling uh, on me. <laughs> Marta, I'm going to um, just take the Twitter question first and then come to you. Is that okay? Great. So uh, Ramona is monitoring the Twitter feed, and so go ahead. Yeah, so this is from Kristen Ahern, and she says, going off of institutions doing things how we've always done things, where do design and production fit? How can performances happen in a way that does not minimize the role of designers as collaborators, but enables us to do art in a more climate safe way? There's a lot of talk about site-specific work and a feeling of minimizing elements of design as the way to make theater in a more sustainable way. Can there be a solution that is inclusive of designers rather than exclusive? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, Marta, have we moved past your thought? Yeah. Okay, good. Chantal, I'm gonna pull on you for a second. So uh, in putting this together, uh, what are you sitting with? thus far in the, in the conversation? Um, I'm hearing a lot of uh, desire to have a multiplicity of um, practices and ways of looking at theater exist while at the same time um, lifting everybody. So it's not it sounds to me like it's not about 
like although there are certain basic things, fundamental things, maybe ideological things we uh, maybe need to ag agree upon, um, I feel like the richness in this group and in the field in general is to let all of these different ways of doing theaters exist at the same time because they come from different people, different traditions, and they reach different audiences who have different needs. Um, and I, th I think I, l I like to be reminded of that because sometimes it's easy to want to, like I get really upset in the world in general when people make blanket statements, like everybody has to do this. Well, maybe not, you know, maybe if you live in the Arctic, you can't eat vegetables all the time. You can't be vegetarian, you know, th you have to take the context into consideration. So I'm, I'm liking being reminded that there are different ways of doing something that are all valid and needed and need to be um, equally supported. Mm -hmm. Yes, Marta, and then Abushek, I'm gonna come back to you for a question. Sorry, I felt deeply responsible to that person that asked that yeah, one question. And so I, I'm gonna I just want to just quickly say that yes, absolutely, inc incorporate the designers and the wherever you guys are um, is essential. And I just They're in here. I missed my plane very quickly, on, um, very slowly actually, um, when I ran into this person who was working on packaging and said that there are 84,000 people that meet in a convention annually of all about um, natural foods and that they don't know about good packaging. And I keep thinking about how can we, sustainable packaging, can, how can we infiltrate you know, all these people in this room into other arenas yeah. um, to, to really move, have a kind of collective impact happening. And I just want to quickly say that th this is such a great gathering and I'm so grateful to be here. And my brain is going bing, 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 bing. So it's very hard to make this calm and come out one word at a time. Okay, so first thing, diversity. I think that a lot of us, um, those of us who are raised in monotheistic traditions have a hard time that we don't think about uh, not finding, coming up with the one truth. Um, and there are many truths, and I don't know if it's true, but I think that in polytheistic and, or philosophical traditions like Buddhism, it's easier to think about multiple truths happening simultaneously, all valid and helpful for given situations. I think we have to move from a mechanistic view of the universe that we inherited from um, a lot of scientists and others um, to a more biological or a biogeochemical view of our world um, and so that we can really think about moving like water rather than logic models as we try to um, move forward and as we come to a rock or whatever, that we just go around it or under it or just, just keep on moving and flowing it. Um, through time. Um, I think that the, those of you who have talked about thinking about nature um, as opposed to other models is, is just spot on. I agree so much. And I think, you know, maybe can we, I like to think what I say ecosystemically. And I think about the different disciplines that we have. Alison has heard this before in Chantal of, you know, the, if, if artists and scientists and urban planners and whatever, we're all different species and we have different languages and different fashions and different ideas of what's on time or not and different acronyms and di absolutely different ways of moving. And they're, But they're very similar and we do talk to each other, but they're different. And we really have to be able to map a kind of ecosystem of change. Like where, how does change really happen among all of these disciplines? How can we all come together and break our isolation to make that happen? Where is the role of the arts? At what junctures? Are the arts really, really critical to help move things along? And, and at what points not? There's a very nationalistic joke that I hope I don't offend anybody. I'm one of these traditions, so I'm offending myself. But it's um, heaven is where the Italians are the cooks, the French are the lovers, the British make the roads, and the Germans make the cars. Hell is where the British cook the food, the Germans are the lovers, the, f the Italians make the roads, and the French make the... No, French make the car, sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, I screwed it up. But, but, but it's the, you, know, you have that idea, right? We all have our incredible strengths, and we want to make sure that we know where are our riches and how can we all put those riches in those great places. Um, closing now. Where are my notes here? Um, I think that also for thinking about the audience is critical, essential, absolutely essential, and they're all different. And I think if those of you may know about the Six Americas um, that has come out of the Yale Forestry School and the George Washington, George Mason University about climate change. And there are six different def demographics that came up out of the survey that was started in 2009 and is done every 
six to 18 months, I can't remember, since, and it's looking at um, Americans from the most alarmed to the most dismissive in terms of climate change and what are their characteristics. And I think that if we can think about creating work with and for people, um, I think it can be much easier because if you speak Chinese to someone who understands only French, it's not as useful as if you can find some kind of estuary, some kind of place where different people can come together and, and commune in some, in some sort of way. So that's all. Great. Uh, so I just, we have, uh, I'm going to take one more um, comment because I said uh, uh, that I was coming back to you. And then we're out of time for this session. The, we go to a break next. Is that what happens? Yes. Yeah, okay, so we'll do one more, but then we're going to go to a break and keep the conversation going in the break. If there's something that's sitting on your head, just keep speaking it into the space. Yep. Uh, so I had a specific question for you since you had brought it up and it relates to Ramona's, uh, the, the Twitter question. Uh, in the world that you're talking about in terms of the, the uh, moving month-long uh, pageant uh, play, uh, what's, what is the role of design there? Uh, Design is very much uh, embedded in the story itself, uh -huh. you see? So it's very important that someone crosses a water body mm -hmm. to go elsewhere mm -hmm. in the story. And hence, in this case, in these villages, there is a river, so one crosses a river. Yeah. Whereas in a different part of the country where uh, it's in the hills, they would have some other way of you know, crossing it. And uh, I mean, there is a version of the Ramayana where Ram, the god himself, is Muslim, so it's a Muslim Ramayana. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, design changes because then mm -hmm. that kind of uh, iconography comes into it. But mm -hmm. it's to do with nature, essentially. Mm -hmm. the, and know. so the na the design is is designing what's the experience into what's already there, rather than building things. Building and the environment mm -hmm. is completely inside the design. Yeah. Great. Right, yeah. Yeah. That I had a feeling that was true for what you were saying. All right. Let's take the break. Yeah. <laughs> she did. She made it. Everybody heard it. <laughs> Good. So let's let's uh, take the break, and we'll be back, and we'll do this uh, format. Very well done for the first time of a circle, you guys. I, that that actually worked quite well. So thank you. Yeah.